welcome everyone. Welcome to today's podcast. Today I'll be interviewing Sonia Kuto. Now Sonia comes through, uh, she lives in Toronto, Canada, and she's a two-time tech founder, managing director with 18 years of, ten, is that Tanua in the tech industry? I hope I said it right. But she's also a breast cancer survivor who's navigated the complexities of a, a, you know, while she's going through breast cancer, she's going through a male dominant, uh, dominated field. And it's her expertise and determination that she uses to get through for her journey. Now, she worked through the treatments and the surgeries, including a double mastectomy and four surgeries. And she is a powerful testimonial, still standing. So welcome, Sonia, welcome to our podcast. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Now, that's the thing I love about it. That's the resilience. You know, today I just read, you're not just a survivor, you're a thriver. So, uh, you know, a lot of people just say, I just made it. I just made it to the other side. And I think what we're trying to do is bring the message that you can go beyond that, not just just made it. So take us through the journey, Sonia. How did you first get diagnosed with breast cancer so take us through that journey yeah um it was six years ago in uh, 2017 yeah 2017 and uh really what happened was i started feeling like numbness on sort of on my side underneath my armpit and for about a week it would come and go come and go but it was sort of it was enough that it was noticeable and i was kind of like what's going on so I went to sort of feel it because I had this sensation that was constantly there and I felt a lump. And so within a couple of days, I made an appointment to go see my doctor. I was 38 at the time. So I wasn't, you know, I didn't think it was breast cancer or anything like that. I thought maybe it would have been a cyst or, you know. So I went to see my doctor and I told her I had found a lump. She didn't even touch me. She automatically said, let's go get a um, ultrasound done because at the time I was too young for a mammogram. So within a week, she had me in to do my ultrasound. So I went in, I was doing the ultrasound and then they sort of said, oh, hold on a second. And a doctor came in to sort of go through the ultrasound again. So I knew that definitely, I mean, I had felt something, I knew something was there and I knew they were sort of invest investigating. And then um, after they, the, they told me there's a mass there, obviously there's something there. So they told me you need to come back and actually do a mammogram. So I was like, okay, got myself ready. I was going to go make an appointment. They're like, no, no, you're doing the mammogram now. So then, you know, my heart sort of sank a little bit. So I went and did the mammogram and then they said, okay, you're done. I was going, I was in the change room and then they came back and said, we need to do a couple more mammogram uh, shots. So I was like, okay, I went back. And then by the time I finished, they told me to sit down and wait for the doctor to come in at this point. So this is when, you know, by the time the doctor came in, I think I waited like two minutes, which felt like two hours. I was already sort of, you know, the knot in my throat. I wanted to cry, but at the same time, I was trying to keep it together. So when they came in, she basically confirmed that, yes, it was a, it was a mass and they, they thought it was cancer, but... They wouldn't know much more about it until I did a biopsy. So a week later, I went in, did the biopsy, got my results, and I found out it was breast cancer. I didn't know what kind of breast cancer it was. I didn't know the stage or anything like that. I got referred to uh, my oncologist right after. So I found out in September, and I had my first surgery in November, so just um, uh, two months after. And um, I did not find out what type of cancer and the stage I was until about December after my surgery, after they sent in all my tissues for um, uh, examination. So I did find out in December that I was in fact stage one and the cancer had not spread to my lymph nodes. So my lymph nodes were clean. I had about six lymph nodes removed. And so because I was stage one, um, and my lymph nodes were clean, I chose not to do chemo. And so I went the um, surgery route where I, instead of doing a lumpsectomy, I chose to do a double mastectomy. So my first surgery, I just did the first mastectomy to get rid of the cancer. So I was flat for about six months on one side. And then I went back in to do the second mastectomy. 
and start the reconstruction process. So I had a skin graft removed from my back. I had the double mastectomy, and then I had tissue expanders put in, which I had for about eight months. And I had to go in every two weeks to get injections to fill the 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 to fill them up uh, to stretch the skin. And then after that, I had my third surgery, um, which was to remove the the tissue expanders and put in the permanent um, ones. And then after my third surgery, the implants that they had given me had got recalled. They were actually causing cancer. <laughs> um, and I still had like a couple little things like my tissue expanders had expanded too much. So I ended up with really large implants that were massive and really bothering me and they hurt. It was very discomforting. So I had to go in for a fourth surgery anyway. So I took the advantage to tell my doctor, okay, let's get rid of these implants, put in new ones that are not going to cause cancer, and let's also downsize. So I went into my fourth surgery to do that, came out of it, ended up with bigger implants bigger than what I had gone in with, which was supposed to be reverse. I was supposed to have come out, come out with much, much smaller. And that's sort of my journey. It's not, I'm, I still need to have, you know, another surgery to hopefully downsize because what I have is just too big. It's painful. I can't sleep. It, they're not comfortable. And so I've had a lot of surgeries and um, I wish I hadn't gone down that route. I probably would have just done radiation or some chemo and got rid of it all. But, you know, you don't know what you you don't know what you don't know. And that's sort of where I'm at six years later. And then, of course, I also did tamoxifen for five years. Then I got up, I got removed from tamoxifen about six months. And I was having some complications um, with um, my face swelling. I got osteoporosis as a result of tamoxifen. And now I'm back on tamoxifen because my estrogen levels were uh, getting out of uh, control again. So I, I'm back on it and, and keep and monitoring that to make sure that uh, my levels are okay. So yes, that's sort of my journey and that's where I'm at now. Wow, Whew. that's a big journey. I mean, the thing is, like you said, you know, anyone under 40, it's not common um because as we know 50 plus gets free mammograms and things like that or 40 plus i think it is um so you don't actually go in thinking it's that so um i just want to go back because i've just written some notes here and and i just wanted to get the sort of the gist of it because like you said six years later you know you sort of thought well what if i had known a little bit better um and maybe gone down a different route or maybe not maybe not so what made you decide because you were like what they call you know when i talk to doctors and my own surgeon and things like that when when we say stage one we all think stage one that's pretty cool but according to a doctor stage one doesn't mean anything it just means that it's a lot smaller than and depending where it is um and it hasn't reached the lymph nodes and things like yeah. that but it still can be um crucial so you need to make sure you know what type of breast cancer. So when you were you were doing all of the tests, were there, it was the doctors that were encouraging you to do the mastectomy or was it you're just thinking, were you, were you tested for BRCA and was it your doctor's decisions to make you do the, the mastectomy or strictly your own? Yeah, I, it was a combination. So um, I didn't have a history in my family at all. Uh, and my family is uh, mostly female uh, dominated and there was no history of breast cancer. And personally, I had had someone close to me who had uh, breast cancer stage three and she had a lumpsectomy. And eight years later after being breast cancer free, it came back. And um, her doctor had told her, you know, get a mastectomy and she chose not to. And it, you know, now she's struggling. So I sort of did a lot of research and I wasn't comfortable with just going in and removing that part and leaving it all in. I just felt like there was too much risk for, you know, one tiny little cell to be there and it starts all over again. So the the mastectomy was always my choice. But the first time I went in to see my doctor, I told her, get them out and get them out now. I just, I got to a point where you get, you get to a point where stress is 
so high on your mind that you're just like, I want to do everything I possibly can to get rid of it. And I know not all women feel that way. A lot of women do lonsectomies. I just didn't want to take the risk. And my doctor supported me. And when I told her I wanted to do the, the double mastectomy, she was like, absolutely. You know, she said, I agree with just getting rid of it. Why take the risk? If I had wanted a lonsectomy, she probably would have given me all the, the risks involved with it. But because I wanted the double, she was supportive. And um, because there was no risk in my family, I don't know why I got breast cancer. So why risk it, right? That's sort of what I was thinking. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, and it's, it, and it's normal to think that way. Like you said, you just want to get it out. You just want to make sure that you're cleared. You don't want to go, you know, six years, 12 years, 15 years, 20 years down the track um, and it rears its ugly head. So obviously yeah. having a, a, a mastectomy, it does go from X percent to really, really tiny, tiny percent um, as well. So, you know, I commend you for it because it's not, you know, I, I, I spoke to another young girl, I think she was 35 and she had, she had a double mastectomy and, you know, for her, it was like, what are these things? Cause it felt so strange for her. So take us through that journey. Like here you are, you've gotten the implant, like you've had your breast removed. How did you go? What emotions were you going through at that time? Yeah. I mean, i for me, it felt like I lost a part of my body. I tell this to people all the time because a lot of people think that getting a, a double mastectomy is nothing hard just because nowadays women are doing it voluntarily to to get, you know, something that's not uh, medically required. Uh, it's mm -hmm. for aesthetics. And so there's this mentality around it's just a boob job, essentially. Um, but I think there's a huge difference when, first of all, the ones that you have are trying to kill you and then you're forced to take them out and replace them with something that's not real. And so I struggled a lot with that because one thing that I, I always think about is when I was young and I started developing my breasts, it was something that I wasn't born with and I got to watch my body change and evolve and it took me from you know, being a little girl to being a teenager, and then you go into womanhood. And that sort of represents that journey in your life. And then all of a sudden, not only are they gone, one thing that I really struggled with was the fact that I lost my nipples, which is something I wasn't really quite aware of. I mean, I knew I was going to have a double mastectomy, but I never thought about it. And that really took a toll on me because now it's, it's completely different. Now I look like an alien. Um, the implant, it's not like women who go in and get, you know, uh, cosmetic stuff done. It, you know, they're lopsided. They're lo I call them two sacks of potatoes. <laughs> I look like an alien. So it's very dramatic. And even though it's been a couple of years, I still have a very hard time looking at myself in the mirror. Um, I just, it's just not, I feel like it's, it's something, uh, it's not something that belongs to my body. I can tell that it's a foreign thing that was put in me and it's really hard to accept i know that I, one day i'll be you know thankful that i'm alive and i am thankful that i'm alive and that i i have something on my chest but it's it's taking me a long time to wrap my mind around it so the the thing about that too is like you said cuz she said the same thing i felt like i had something foreign what are these aliens in me but um I get, see, like I'm, um, okay, so I'm much older, you know, than you. I'm 53. I'll be 53 this year. So when we look at someone who's in your, you know, mid-30s and things like that, you haven't, you have, don't get me wrong, but you haven't experienced all of life. So, of course, what you want to do is you want to make sure that you experience it. And then what happens is whether you had a partner or whether you want to find a partner, you go through that because that's another thing as well. So if I could, you know, touch on some things like that, if you mind talking about it, if yeah. you don't, it's okay. Um, if you had a partner at the time or if you have a partner now, how does it make you feel? It's not about the partner's feelings as such, yeah. but how does it make you feel? I didn't have a partner at the time and I don't have a partner now. <laughs> and I think that's, <laughs> that's part it. of it. Um, 
I had I, I had been divorced for a couple of years after I got diagnosed, and I I was kind of happy that I didn't have a partner, to be honest, just because mm. I felt like if I had a partner, I would have had the stress of worrying about myself and someone else. So I think I think that was sort of lucky for on my part where I didn't have to deal with that. I could just focus on my own health. Um, but it is hard for me to think about dating and having to expose myself. You know, I, I remember a couple of years ago, I decided I was going to start dating again. <laughs> and I was going out on dates and it was always like, well, at what point do I tell someone that I'm a breast cancer survivor? Do I tell them mm. right away? Do they really need to know that part of me? I don't know this person that well. But then if I don't tell them right away and it goes somewhere that I deceit them and mm. by not telling them but at the same time it's something you know it's not I, I don't mind talking about it but when it's like on the, the dating side of things it is something private absolutely absolutely and then and then of course there's also like you know getting to the point where you're intimate with someone it's not something i'm i'm comfortable with and it's not something i'm looking forward to <laughs> to be quite honest mm. i don't think i don't think it's something i'll ever feel comfortable with and so I think I'd rather just be single so I don't have to deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully you do find someone because the thing is the world has got some amazing people out there. Yeah. Um, and you'd be really surprised because I spoke, I remember speaking to one lady who had one breast uh, and she had the other one, she had an implant in it. And she reckons for guys it was like, oh, this is different. <laughs> you know, and, he, and she would just laugh. He's like, this is like, trying something new you know um, so she was worried about that too how are they going to react if things get a little bit more intimate and yeah. things like that but she she's got to the point where she was saying that they would just be like oh, this is this is something different the thing is with breast cancer it's it's unfortunately so common now that men could be with someone and five minutes later they got breast cancer or five years later they got breast cancer or 50 years later, they got breast cancer, right, so to yeah. speak. So the thing is, it, uh, I think that it's not something that a guy, and if it is, is the guy shallow, sorry, I have to say it, or the girl, whichever, you know, if someone is dating same sex, they're shallow people because it's it just means that you don't understand. This is, mm -hmm. like you said, it wasn't a choice, as yeah. in you didn't go, oh, I don't like my a size breast i'm i want a double d size that's different again but um but this is something that you had to do for, a, yeah. for health reasons so yeah. you know again i commend you on it because you are young um i i also uh work with a lot of women or i you know i sort of interact with a lot of women who have flat flat chested now and that's yeah. another thing that people are opting for as well. So, but it all, like you said, it's a personal choice at the end of the day. Yeah, um, and I think, I think going flat for some women, um, it's also the the reconstruction process. I don't feel like we. I was. I talked to a lot of women. A, mo, a lot of women say that they were not given all the information that they should have had. To know what that process was going to be like you know i'm four surgeries in i know women that have are eight surgeries in and they're still going mm. through that process and it's not just having your implants put in it's the scars as well i had tissue removed from my back i have a massive scar there i've had four surgeries i have like i think six seven scars and they're not small right so um, there's that whole process. I just don't think that the reconstruction, I mean, thank God we have surgeries uh, to get cancer out of your body, but the reconstruction process, it still, little, it still feels a little bit like you're being butchered. I don't think it's quite there yet where it seems like, you know, you do, I think as a woman, you feel like you've been under a butcher for sure. <laughs> and I think yeah. that's what's on our mind. We feel like we've been under a butcher and so we think we look like we've been under one. Yeah, absolutely. Because there's a there's another term which I'm trying I'm trying to wreck my brain, but I can't remember it. Um, it's a it's a method that's come out of Italy originally. A professor in Italy started doing it. And when I heard that, what they do is they they replace 
the breast with your own body fat from like they can take it out of your buttocks, back of your yeah. thighs, wherever you want to get a nice trimness done. Um, and they place it in the breast. I thought, oh, well, that means you leave the tissue. And then I got told, no, 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 we still cut it out. But yeah. instead of putting implants, they put the fatty tissues in and things like that. So, of course, it's a big, it's a big thing. Um, you know, like you said, it, you, you now have scarrings done. I know myself because my sister opted to have a double mastectomy. She wasn't, uh, she wasn't diagnosed with cancer. But once I got diagnosed, she was a little bit worried, so she had a double mastectomy. And I do remember seeing her scarring, and you know, for for someone seeing it, I just think, well, they're just they're just war wounds. It's okay, but for yeah. someone personally, it's it's on a different level. And I would never say, oh, I understand, because then I'd be lying. Um, but um, I, I I I'm glad you touched on that, because like you said, not many people know the process the physical and the emotional side of having a double mastectomy. Yeah. But I wanted to go back onto the psychological side now because you said you were married and divorced, things like that. Um, why do you think you got breast cancer? <laughs> Honestly, so my breast cancer was hormone positive. And I'm going to completely make an assumption this is not fact. This is just my brain. There's no research behind this. Um, hormone positive, the reason why I'm on tamoxifen is to keep the estrogen levels in my body under control. And I think for in my early 20s, late 30s, early 30s, sorry, uh, or, or, or late 20s, I can't remember exactly the date, I was on birth control for a couple of years. And birth control is pumping estrogen into your body. So if you have any type of cancer in your body and you have too much estrogen, estrogen feeds cancer. So even if I had one tiny little cell and I had all this estrogen pumping into my body, it would have fed it and it would have grown. That's my own personal belief. I don't know if that's a fact. It's just, you know, as I try to make sense of all this, I think that might have have I think that that could have been a contributing fact to to me getting breast cancer. Is it a reality? I don't know. What else could it have been? I'm not sure. I lived a pretty healthy lifestyle. The other thing also I have to say is that I never had children. And I do think that could have been a factor in it as well. I did not know that women in their late 30s who have not had kids are at higher risk of getting breast cancer. My doctor never told me I never heard this anywhere you know when you see all of these websites and these charities telling you to check yourself no one ever mentions or I've never heard anybody ever say hey if you're in your late 30s early 40s and you haven't had children you're at higher risk so check yourself more often I've never heard that so that could have been a factor as well I never had children um so yeah those are my two sort of my conspiracy theories on that <laughs> Well, I was going to throw some more out there for you, but um, <laughs> but before I do so, I was just going to ask about that because that's a great point you said uh, that you didn't have children. Were you also asked to do a hysterectomy or you that's something that you weren't asked to do? You didn't need to do? No, I don't. I haven't. I haven't had to. Um, my doctor didn't, hasn't mentioned it to me. I mean, I go and see my doctor every six, every six months still. And my doctor always says it's because I'm, I'm young and she wants to keep an eye out. I think, in, I think my general health, aside from getting cancer, is pretty good. And I do take fairly good care of myself. The rest of my reproductive system seem, seems to be pretty good. Although the tamoxifen is causing me to go into early menopause. And, you know, yeah, you, I saw your face when I said the word tamoxifen. That's a whole other concept. <laughs> Uh, but overall, like I think I'm pretty good aside aside from the side effects of tamoxifen. So no, I have not had a hysterectomy. I can't pronounce it. <laughs> yeah, hysterectomy. Yeah, yeah. But that's why um that's why I asked because generally what they do is um I've known of of women who have had to have double mastectomies that have been asked to do the hysterectomy. So when they're young and they haven't had children they actually freeze their eggs mm -hmm. and if they have that possibility and it's really important that the doctor actually mentions that but like you said it's because 
once you start getting into the tamoxifen and things like that, there's, and, I, and, I, and it's not everyone, I'm just going to, you know, it doesn't happen to everyone, but it can cause other issues yeah. in the reproductive area. So that's why they try and take both of them away. So then that eliminates it. But like mm-hmm. you said, you're, you're keeping an eye on it and that's the best thing to do. Um, and every yeah. six months is, I know it's uh, it's anxious, you know, related when you have to go every six months, but it's better than nothing at all. But yeah, I I'm wanted to throw it now. Yeah, yeah, that's why you do. You do. Like when my doctor gives me one year, yeah, you know, I I get super excited. She's like, (laughs) yeah, she's given me a year. Uh, But normally I'm six months as well. (laughs) Yeah. I just want to mention they did, my doctor did ask me if I wanted to freeze eggs. And I chose not to because at that point I was like, because they told me if I chose to have children, uh, I would have to get off tamoxifen for a year first. And then clean my body out of the tamoxifen and then go into uh, the eggs and all that. And so I thought, you know, if I need to be on tamoxifen for five years in order to feel safe, I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to get pregnant during that time. And by the time I'm done, I'm going to be in my 40s. So I didn't I just didn't feel there was a point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's fair enough, because I was going to ask how long you had to take the tamoxifen for. So it's five years. So you did five, and now you're going to do another five. So really 10 years is generally yeah. what they asked for the tamoxifen. I have heard that. But I was going to throw another shift in the spanner when you said, like, your conspiracy theory. <laughs> and um, so a lot of, you know, the one of the things that I read about you that um, it was, you know, saying that you are in a, very high dominated male dominating field Mm -hmm. now this is just my hallucination um (laughs) because i i worked in a very dominating male field when i got diagnosed i we were running a construction company and i was looking after 22 staff which were all men um so and my husband was on his spiritual journey when all of this sort of started to boil up so I always say, was I surprised? Yeah, of course I was surprised. But was I surprised? No, I wasn't. Mm-hmm. Because I feel like I was holding, I was suppressing a lot of stress. I wasn't being myself. Do you feel that way about you? Like where there was traumas or something that was sort of contributing at the time? You know, it could have been a year before, could have been two years before, but something was happening, could have yeah. even been longer. I mean, yeah, you make a really good point. I hadn't even quite really thought about it. But, yeah, I mean, I had been in a really crappy marriage, divorced, on my own, trying to, you know, make it by myself without any outside help, uh, you know, paying the bills. So I'm always stressed out. And stress is something that before breast cancer I really struggled with. I Luckily, breast cancer taught me some really valuable life lessons in life, like, getting really good sleep, like eating really well and resting and meditating to deal with stress and things like that. But I think prior, I was fairly healthy, but anxiety and stress was something that I did not deal with well. And I had a lot of it going on. And it wasn't just, you know, divorce and and then worrying about being on my my own and failing and falling on my face, but also work. I had like, all these responsibilities. I'm I'm running a company. I have two startups that I'm in in charge of, and I'm running them and taking them off the ground. And I lost most of my team during that time, who basically abandoned me. And I was running this all by myself. So there was a lot of stress. And you're right. I mean, that could have been something that contributed to it as well. Because mm. I sometimes think that it, it's my hallucination. That sometimes what happens is when we're diagnosed with something, it's because what it's doing is it's trying to slow us down. It's a, it's like a hey there, wake up. I'm trying to tell you to slow yeah. down, um, and then the body brings out a disease of some sort. And I always say that. I always think you know, and it, it's quite interesting because. I'm yet to find anyone, and I'm not trying to, it's because it's part of life that doesn't have some sort of stress or anxiety or some trauma happening before they get diagnosed because I think it's the unbalance. When we're not being our authentic self, it's that unbalancing 
sort of thing. So that's why I sort of wanted to bring that up. Yeah. I, I, I think it's funny that you're saying that because I have thought about that a million times. I'm like, my body was giving me the signs. I ignored it. And it was like, you're going to listen now. I'm going to give you something that's going to cause you to really slow down. So I totally agree with what you said. <laughs> it's horrible. It's a horrible way. It's like, really? really? Yeah. But <laughs> life doesn't give you something you can't handle. This is true. Yep. So as, as tough of it as it was, it's not easy. Yeah. But life's like, you can handle this, Sonia. I know you've got this. I'm going to get you to strip back what your belief was before. I'm yeah. going to get you to that level, but I'm going to rebuild you. And I'm going to rebuild you into this amazing, thriving person that you are today. And like you said, you know that. So going forward now, we're six years later, we're thriving, we're doing amazing. So what in your life has come about? Like what has happened in your life that it, it causes you to look at life now in a different way and say, you know what, I am in a better place than I was. Yeah. You know, I really am in a better place. And I think a lot of it was due to, because of breast cancer, I started doing therapy. And I initially started doing therapy because of breast cancer, but then I continued it even after I no longer had breast cancer. And it just taught me so much in about myself, about who I am, where I am, my childhood, how to deal and cope with things that I ne never really knew how to in the past, and build boundaries with people and things in my life that I never really did before it, it's had a interesting uh, a side effect to it not everyone accepts that I've changed in a certain way and that I am a certain way now and I'm more assert assertive and I stand up for myself which I didn't before but I am in the mindset now that you know my cancer could come back it is a constant thought on my head I had cancer in my body I'm lucky that I did the five-year remission, but it could come back. So I'm not going to waste it on stupid things and people. I'm going to make the best of it. And I'm going to do the things that I love, that I'm passionate about. And anyone who comes my way to add a drama to it or stress me out, I'm like, I'm not having it today. Not today, devil. Not today. <laughs> I'm getting so emotional. Just that part that you just said is what I talk about. And that's the part where you say, I've been given a second chance and I'm not going to waste it. I'm not going to waste it on things, on people, on situations that no longer serves me. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the rebuilding of the soul, I call it. You know, the outside is falling apart and has to heal but it's the soul that gets stronger and stronger. So I love that. It's such a good way to put it. Yeah. I, I, I tell people all the time, it doesn't matter what your body's going through. Just build that soul. Just mm -hmm. when I say, cause I'm sure you heard, Oh, have courage, Sonia, be strong, Sonia. Yeah. And that used to pee me off <laughs> until I realized, no, no, no. I know where I had to have courage. My soul had to have courage. Yeah. My soul had to have faith and my soul had to be strong. And then whatever came, comes. Because like you said, you don't know what happens tomorrow. None of us do. Yeah. You're not going to waste it. Yeah. So thank you for that. I commend you on that because, yeah. Whew. So what are you doing now, Sonia? What are, what's Sonia doing these days? That's making yeah. it just amazing. <laughs> I'm, uh, I, I like to think that I'm living my best life. I'm doing the things that I'm passionate about. I'm living slow. Uh, before I used to be a go, 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 go. Now I'm still sort of go, 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 but it's very slow paced. I'm uh, working on things that I'm passionate about. My career is, it's not a job. It's something that I love. And I get up in the morning. I'm so happy to go do uh, the things that I, I, I love to do. Breast cancer is something I, I'm passionate about. I, I'm involved in, with uh, charities that are uh, helping women after the breast cancer journey because um, for a lot of uh, women, you know, going through chemo and radiation and losing your hair and surgery, everyone sort of focuses on that journey, but no one really focuses on the after journey, which is 
mental health, physical, um, you know, all that stuff. Uh, the the just the stress alone of thinking about the fact that cancer could come back is something that mm. people don't talk about. And women are constantly. I have friends that some of my best friends are breast cancer survivors now because I did you know, join charities and I build relationships with other survivors, I've watched a lot of them die, right? That's the only downside to being involved in, you know, people who have had uh, cancer is you, you get to watch a lot of people die years after they've been, you know, cancer free. Uh, so I'm just, I'm not wasting time. I'm not doing foolish things. I don't really care what people think or don't think about me. I'm I'm living my life. I'm I'm very involved in tech, and I recently actually started a podcast that's called Tenacity with Tanya, and it's all about just living, you know, building businesses and wanting to go into leadership and how tenacious you have to be to get there, but also tenacious in life and um, you know just doing what you love and and not being apologetic about it. Wow. And, and I, I was just with my cat. <laughs> oh, I love cats. I've got two of my own. So I don't have children, but I got two fur babies, <laughs> I call them. Yeah. <laughs> so um that's 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 the thing that, you know, uh, it's just like you said too, I, I wanted to point that out where you said also where you change and there's people that all of a sudden they get a bit funky around us and they think, oh, she's not who they used to be. Sonia's not that person that she used to be. Sonia is that person who would allow me to do this and this and this around her. And they sort of get a little bit funky around that. But did you find that when you went through this, the people who you least expected stepped up and the people that you were expecting just ran away? Oh, my gosh, yes, absolutely. I'm glad you said it. Because every time I talk about that, people are like, no, 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 my, my people were there. And I'm like, oh, lucky you. <laughs> but you're right. And I did, yeah, I, did right. Have, I did have people that I didn't even know that long who really stepped up for me. And I'm like, wow, you're, you're here. You're in the hospital visiting me. Like it was unexpected. But everything happens for a reason, right? Absolutely. And that's what we talk about when we say like detox, detox. I always say detox your community, detox the people around you. It doesn't mean you got to send them off with a PO, you know, yeah. in a nasty way. You just send them love and you go, you know, get down that way and I'm going to go this way and that's okay. Yeah. So, and that's that's what makes you thrive within. That's what makes you realise. Do you think, let me ask you this question, because I think you do, but let me ask you this question. Do you think you're living your authentic self now? Yes. I mean, definitely like 85%. I think sometimes it's, you fall back into some of, you know, your old habits, okay. but I'm very conscious and I'm very aware of myself and I know I'm a pushover and I find sometimes myself going back in, 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 in being in push pushover mode. But then when I realize that I'm there, I get right out of it and I go into it like a thousand percent. So yeah, I totally agree with you. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and that's really important that, like you said, we're human, so we can always fall back into our old habits and things like that. But if we're genuinely, genuinely, say that again, uh, living our authentic self, it's the body goes, oh, there you are. The soul goes, oh, finally, finally, you're where you're supposed to be. Um, and you're not sugarcoating, you're not people pleasing, you're not whatever we did to get, you know, that connection. We all, we're human beings wanting human connection and yeah. we'll get it any way we think we have to. And, and one of them is people pleasing or one of them is, oh, I can't say that, I can't be this because what's that person going to think? So it's beautiful to hear. And I, and I, I sort of, I don't have a sixth sense where I see dead people, so don't get me wrong, but I, um, God, that'll be scary, but I actually have a sense of people and I, that's why for me you're generally coming across living your authentic self and that's, that's really important because, like you said, this journey, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Well, none of us do, but at least you're living the life you want to live and you're working. Well, you're not working. You're doing something that you love doing, which is great. Yeah. Again, it's going, you're not going against the grain. Yeah. Um, so about that, about your work, do you want to mention your podcast? I'd love to hear more about your podcast as well. I'll, I'll make sure I put the links below. Yeah. So I just launched it this January. So I started 
recording last year. Uh, it's called Tenacity with Sonia C. And it's um, conversations with leaders who have built companies and mm -hmm. um, are teaching now the, the next generation of entrepreneurs and founders who want to build, whether it's a tech company or whether they want to be a coaching, uh, a, a coach, um, you know, just learning from the people who have failed, learned from those failures and became successful so that they can, they have a go-to, hey, I'm struggling with this. Oh, this person went through that. What did they do? And, and how did they solve those problems? And and just teaching, like like I said, that's why it's called tenacity, just teaching people to be tenacious. I find that, you know, we live in a generation where things, everyone sort of has this mentality where things are going to come easy because there's internet and you can make money with e-commerce and social media and become an influencer and all that stuff. But I think that, you know, hard work and learning every day on uh, and failing I, I love failures because that's when you learn the most is when you fail so i love that concept and i failed a couple times in personal a life and a business so i just wanted to do something with other professionals that felt the same way i did and, and just build a platform for people to learn and uh whether it's starting a company whether it's you know wanting to just be a better person whether it's like learning how to handle you know pressure or stress or how to get out of bed every day there's something there for people to learn from wow that's really amazing and like you said we really need that um, because if i don't know anyone who hasn't failed no one i know no one who hasn't failed even yeah. the best of the best have failed um you know if you hear of michael jordan they say that out of all his shots, you know, he had over 200 shots, he only would get 20 or whatever it was. I'm probably misquoting it, but in the sense that he would lose more of his three pointers than get his three pointers. But everyone knew as Michael Jordan as this amazing person. But look at his life, he worked hard and yeah. he failed just as hard. Um, so that's really, really important. And like you said, learning from your failures and, 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 and growing from that, not learning and you know, poor me, pity party, but growing. So that's really, really important. So yes, yeah, so definitely I'll, I'll put the link as well so people can start following. Because it is important because here you are now um, who's gone through some failures in life like we all have and you're saying, you know what, don't, don't, don't do what I did or if you have to, these are, the, these are some, some things that you can try out mm -hmm. for yourself. Uh, like you said, whether it's in business, whether it's in personal, whether it's in relationship, whatever it may be, people can learn from others. Um, you know, you stand on the shoulder of giants, they say. So mm -hmm. why not? Why not? So that's really important. Was there anything else you wanted to mention to our, our viewers and our listeners? No, I mean, I just anybody who um, is might be struggling or going through a, a breast cancer or any type of disease. I think, you know, I've gotten to a place in my life where I, I've told this to a couple of people and they're like, that's why would you say something like that? Like, if I die tomorrow, I would die a very happy person. I've just reached such a good place where I'm like, I'm, you know, was it weird for me to say that I'm not afraid to die? <laughs> Like, if I'm gone tomorrow, I'm gone. Like, I'm okay with that. And so all I want to say is if you're going through something, um, use it for good for yourself. Use it to learn um, internally. And, and, and there, is, there are steps to, to do that. Once you sort of get over the surgeries and, and treatments, you, you fall into this place where it's like, okay, now what? Now I'm not doing surgery. Now I'm not doing chemo. Now what do I do? And that, and take advantage of that place. Cause I think that's exactly where it is. That spot to really focus on you and find that peace. Cause I think that's where that peace really lies and just make the best of it. You're going to find yourself when you come out of it. You're always going to think about breast cancer. I'm breast cancer free, but I'm still a breast cancer patient. That's, that's how I see it. But I've, yeah. you, you get to a place where you just find peace, where it's like, yeah, if I die tomorrow, I, I'm okay with that. And I'm not, 
I don't regret anything. I'm not sorry about anything that I leave behind or people that I leave behind. Maybe my cat. But you know what I mean? I'm just like, I'm just in such a good place where I'm like, I've now lived a, an amazing life. I've done things. I'm good. See you later. <laughs> wow. That's uh, honestly, it's like you've just picked my brain because that's exactly what I talk about all the time. It's getting to that place because you don't know what's going to happen. But when your soul is strong, when your soul, you know who you are, if you have to check out tomorrow, you know what? I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. It's that place of peace. And that's where we want to get so many people, not the place, the place of fear, not the place of what's going to happen to me. When you get to the place where you go, you know what? Yeah. If I have to check out right now, I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. And that's what it means about living your authentic self. When you start living how you're truly put on this earth, um, it's really important. And I guess that little small window, like you mentioned, you know, after, because a lot of people say the same. Thank you, Dr. Sis. Thanks. You're cancer free. See you later. Go yeah. have a nice life. And then you're stuck with this baggage of emotions and go, oh, now what? How do I yeah. deal with this? And there's not a lot of support groups of no. the after. It's the now in between, but not the after. And yeah. it's the after that you need to nourish. You need to heal. Find out who am I? Who am yeah. I? You know, I'm, I'm not the breast cancer survivor. I'm not the person who just went after, you know, had so many operations. I'm not the wife. I'm not the business owner. Who am I? Who am I? When you close that light at night and you go to bed, who am I? Mm -hmm. um, and when you can get to that place of peace, it's just an amazing place. So that's why I was like, yes, I'm not the only one who says that. <laughs> I mean, I, I love how you put it. Like, I'm going to go away from this uh, episode. I'm going to be like, oh, like, I loved how you said about the soul. It's, you know, I, I knew in my brain, like, how I felt, but I just loved you. You put it so nicely. And now I'm going to, like, really go and think about that. <laughs> I really am. Uh, like a, yeah. Well, that's because when people, that's what going back to it. That's when people were saying to me, be strong, be courageous, have faith, have hope. Yeah. To me. It was stop, stop. I, I can't hear this BS. To me, it was BS mm -hmm. because I didn't feel it. It was an external thing until one day I just went back home and I went, oh, this is where the courage is. Yeah. It's not here. It's the soul. So once my courage stepped up, my cancer was in the back seat. I'm driving. It's yeah. my life. You're taking the back seat. So that's where it is. I always say to people, when your your soul is you have courage, faith, hope, trust in your soul. Like we said before, if you check out tomorrow, I'm good because yeah. I know who I am. Yeah. So it's really, really important. And I think uh, uh, you know, it, it's important to to share the message that you have to others. It really is. And you know, I mean, it, you might think that I'm just, you know oh my god overreacting but when i hear people speaking my language it's <laughs> like <laughs> i know it's true <laughs> <laughs> um and it's not for anything it's because you're on the other side you're in toronto canada yeah. up until this moment you and i have never met yet we have that same thought pattern yeah it does where does that come you. from it's your, it's your, um, it's your conscious level, your unconscious yeah. level, the, the back part of us that we're born knowing, hang on, this is, this is what we're going to go through and it's okay because once I heal this part, everything will be okay. Even when it's, when I talk to, because I, I mentor women, I don't know where their journey is going to end. Mm -hmm. None of us do. But when I say to them, when you can say, I know where I am. I'm home. And you were to check out tomorrow, you'll be fine. Yeah. It's when you're not home. That's the scary part. You know, that's the fearful part of the, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. None of us do. No. But when you can be at peace with it, that's when you can live. And, and the thing is, is people don't have, don't, people don't fear dying. It's because they don't live. Yeah. That's what it is. They fear not living. Um, so, yeah, is there anything else you wanted to, to mention 
Sonia. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Oh my God. It, you've, it, it's, this has been amazing. Yeah. I can't wait to share this. It really has been amazing because again, you know, cancer has touched so many women, so many ages, so many backgrounds, nationalities, whatever you say, it has no, what's the word that they say? Cancer has no, whatever it is. I'm it trying no to hear it. But it has, has no boundaries, but it also, it doesn't discriminate yeah you know um it doesn't mean because i'm 53 i get i i get you know hey i'm out of here uh i don't get it and you're third doesn't mean anything it just does not discriminate and you know i um i think that's important where people hear the stories of someone who's in their 30s someone who's in their 40s someone who's in their 50s someone who's in their 60s um it's really really important to take that message because at the end of the day we have all different types of cancer. It's like a, yeah. almost a, a fingerprint, but we're all on the same journey for our yeah. destiny, you know, um, and that's really important to share that. So thank you, Sonia. Thank you so much for being on my podcast. Um, where can people reach you, Sonia, other than yeah. your podcast? So I, my social media is techie, uh, Sonia C, techie, T E. C H I E Sonia S O N I A C. That's my social media. Uh, LinkedIn, it's Sonia Kuro, um, and you, you can also find, I have a website that links to everything that I have, and it's SoniaKuro.com. So you can always go on there, and then you'll find uh, the companies, you'll find my podcasts, my my social media handles, everything there. So that's probably the best place to go. Fantastic. So if Sonia's story resonates with you, please reach out. I'm sure if you've got a question, um, you know, it's something that Sonia has said that sort of just put a seed in your mind and you want to sort of get some more information, I'm, I'm sure Sonia could reach out to you on an email and just sort of, you know, answer any questions you might have. But I thank you again, Sonia. Really thank you so much for being on my podcast. And thanks, everyone. And I hope you guys enjoyed today's podcast. And like always, I wish you so much love and light. Yeah. <laughs>